This virtual slow art presentation will examine the Moderns Number no. 5, 1952, by Jackson Pollock. In 1985, the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth acquired 21 works by Pollock, including Number no. 5, 1952, from his Black Paintings series. Time magazine called him Jack the Dripper, and critic Robert Coates called his works mere unorganized explosions of random energy and therefore meaningless. In 1949, Life magazine asked the question, Jackson Pollock, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? Pollock was one of the most influential artists of his era and one of the best known artists in the world. He is the subject of a Pulitzer Prize winning biography and an Oscar winning movie. He developed one of the most radical abstract styles in the history of modern art, and his work was, and continues to be, controversial. However, the critic Clement Greenberg considered Pollock's works to be the best painting of its day. To better understand number five, 1952, we need to know a bit more about Jackson Pollock and his development as an artist. Pollock was born in 1912 in Cody, Wyoming, but he didn't live there very long. The family moved around the West to Arizona and throughout California. And when the family was living in Los Angeles, Pollock enrolled in the Manual Arts High School, where he discovered his passion for art. In 1930, at the age of 18, Pollock moved to New York City and started studying at the Arts Students League with representational regionalist painter, Thomas Hart Benton. Here is Thomas Hart Benton's The Ballad of the Jealous Lover of Lone Green Valley from 1934. However, when we take a look at Pollock's Going West from the same year, we notice Benton's influence, but we also notice that Pollock seems to be trying to make his painting less and less representational. There's an assertion of abstraction that hints at the willfulness and independence that was to remain an important trait of the artist throughout his life. He reduces the depiction of the caravan to a collection of geometric shapes and narrows the range of colors he uses to depict the scene. In fact, throughout his career, Pollock explores the linkage between representation and abstraction. And we will see this clearly when we look at number five, 1952, in some detail. During the Depression, Pollock found work with the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, in the easel division. And although Pollock made over 50 easel paintings with the WPA, he was most attracted to the works of the muralists and began to recognize the power of painting on a large scale. We will see the influence of large scale painting in the works Pollock produces during his drip period. Diego Rivera, the Mexican muralist whose work we see here, was a big influence on Pollock, as was the work of the Surrealists and the work of Picasso. Like his father before him, Pollock had problems with alcohol. In fact, at the age of 16, he began drinking regularly. In the late 1930s, he was diagnosed with acute alcoholic depression, and in 1938, he spent four months in the hospital undergoing psychiatric treatment for his excessive drinking. Upon his release from the hospital, he continued to work with the Jungian therapist. The Swiss psychologist, Carl Jung, believed that universal patterns and images are part of each person's collective unconscious, which contained all the knowledge and experiences we share as a species. Jung further believed that these patterns or archetypes are given shape through symbolic images. Pollock's therapist encouraged him to draw or paint as a way to help him articulate his deeper thoughts. 
1938, Pollock produced an oil on canvas masked image, which is in the Fort Worth Moderns collection. Here we can see that Pollock has moved even further away from pictorial realism than was the case in Going West. But the floating figures here are still recognizable enough to evoke questions about what they might symbolize. Pollock was fascinated with Picasso and with Native American shamanism, and Jung believed that the shaman had a direct line to the unconscious. Masked image has been compared with Picasso's Girl Before a Mirror from 1932. In the Modern Art Museum catalog, published in 2019, Michael Opping states that masks used by shamans to communicate with the supernatural and induce personality transformations are symbols, like the mirror in the Picasso piece, that represent both reflection and an inner search for self. Perhaps in masked image, Pollock is searching for an identity for himself and his art. According to Wapping, it is one of Pollock's most personal formative works. When the WPA ends in 1943, Pollock had to find work. He gets a job as a custodian at the Museum of Non-Objective Painting, which later becomes the Guggenheim Museum. He meets Peggy Guggenheim, who invites him to submit work to her Art of This Century Gallery. She also provides Pollock with a stipend of $150 per month, later raised to $300 per month. Guggenheim gives him his first solo show at her gallery in November of 1943, and he is the first American artist to be shown there. But more importantly, Guggenheim also gives him his first commission by asking him to create a mural for the entry hall of her New York City townhouse. Her friend and advisor, Marcel Duchamp, suggested that the mural be done on canvas so that it could be transported. Guggenheim purchased the canvas for Pollock and he created Mural. It was an important transitional piece for Pollock, the artist, as well as a turning point for American art. The largest work Pollock ever made, Mural is eight feet by 20 feet and was immediately recognized as important. Clement Greenberg said after seeing it in Guggenheim's townhouse, I took one look at it and I thought, now that's great art. And I knew Jackson was the greatest painter this country had produced. Mural has been at the University of Iowa Museum of Art since 1951. Many influences are evident in the piece, such as the murals of Diego Rivera, the abstraction bordering on the figurative of Picasso, and the surrealist technique of automatism, which attempts to abandon conscious control to allow the unconscious mind to guide the hand. According to Pollock, everything is charging across the goddamn surface. While there is some suggestion of figuration, the overall impact is that of abstraction and freedom from the restrictions imposed by figures. Many critics state that with Mural, Pollock redefined the possibilities of painting. In 1942, Pollock meets artist Lee Krasner and they marry in 1945. With a down payment from Peggy Guggenheim, they move out of New York City and purchase this house in Springs on East Hampton, Long Island. The move away from bars and temptations in Manhattan was good for Pollock. He enjoyed the luxury of space he found in Springs and gradually embarked on a period of sobriety. It was in the studio in Springs that Pollock began to develop what would become his signature style, dubbed by critic Harold, Harold Rosenberg, action painting. Pollock would roll out the canvas on his studio floor, tacking it down rather than stretching it on a wood frame, and then attack it 
with paint. He would whip his entire body around so he could get the drip pattern just as he wanted it. And the paintings evoke an athleticism and a wild kinetic energy. We can see Pollock in action as he explains his artistic process in this archival video. My home is in Springs, East Hampton, Long Island. I was born in Cody, Wyoming, 39 years ago. In New York, I spent two years at the Art Students League with Tom Benton. He was a strong personality to react against. This was in 1929. I don't work from drawings or color sketches. My painting is direct. I usually paint on the floor. I enjoy working on a large canvas. I feel more at home, more at ease in a big area. Having the canvas on the floor, I feel nearer, more of a part of the painting. This way I can walk around it, work from all four sides, and be in the painting, similar to the Indian sand painters of the West. Sometimes I use a brush, but often prefer using a stick. Sometimes I pour the paint straight out of the can. I like to use a dripping, fluid paint. I also use sand, broken glass, pebbles, string, nails, or other foreign matter. A method of painting is the natural growth out of a need. I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. Technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. When I am painting, I have a general notion as to what I am about. I can control the flow of the paint. There is no accident, just as there is no beginning and no end. Sometimes I lose a painting. But I have no fear of changes, of destroying the image. Because a painting has a life of its own, I try to let it live. <laughs> During his drip period, Pollock invented a new, distinctly American artistic idiom, painting as free jazz, painting as improvisation. In fact, Pollock listened to jazz while making his drip paintings. His works are wild and raving, freedom and chaos seemingly all whipped together. The complicated swirls and gestural layering broke all the rules of representation. Full Fathom Five from 1947 is one of the masterpieces of Pollock's drip technique. According to Vermeer Haftman, like a seismograph, the painting recorded the energies and the states of the man who drew it. When Pollock's friend Hans Hoffman remarked that Pollock needed to work more from nature, Pollock famously said, I don't paint nature, I am nature. Pollock's work during the drip period caused a sensation, not only in the art world, but with the Life magazine article in popular culture as well. However, the drop period lasted only three years, from 1947 to 1950. During two of those years, Pollock was sober, and many consider the works done during the drip period 
to be Pollock's best. But in the autumn of 1950, on the evening that Hans Namath finished shooting his second short film of Pollock, the artist became agitated and drank some bourbon to calm down. He never regained sobriety. That same year, Pollock visited an exhibition of black paintings by de Kooning, Motherwell, and Miro at the Kutz Gallery in New York. He probably also saw the black paintings of Franz Klein at the Charles Egan Gallery. And in an artistic context where monochromatic studies seem to be the fashion, Pollock started working in black. In 1951, Pollock produced 28 black paintings, with 16 more in 1952, and an additional 10 in 1953. And here is the Modern's black painting, number five, 1952. Initially, the black paintings were called black and white paintings, but the white we see is unprimed cotton duck, not white paint. At first, the black paintings were dismissed as indicative of Pollock's worsening depression, and they were not popular. When the black paintings were exhibited at the Betty Parsons Gallery in 1951 and at the Stanley Janis Gallery in 1952, not a single one sold. When we look more closely at number five, we notice that the alterations in the thickness of the line bring out darker and lighter shades of black. Because unprimed canvas is soft, when the black enamel was poured onto it, the paint bled into the canvas, producing soft, fuzzy edges. As Pollock applied layer after layer of paint, the top layer didn't seep in as much and remained glossier, producing darker, more distinct lines. Patches of paint on number five are so thick and shiny that they still appear wet. Pollock's wife, Lee Krasner, explained his technique in making the black paintings. Using sticks and hardened or worn out brushes and a basting syringe, his control was amazing, she said. He was able to control the flow of the paint as well as the gesture. There was no place for his gestures to hide and what was applied was to remain seen. Over the course of Pollock's development as an artist, we have noticed that his works have become more abstract, culminating with the drip paintings. However, figures and archetypes never completely disappeared from Pollock's creations. And we notice in number five, 1952, that as Pollock has said, the figure is coming through. When we look closely, we see a seated female, perhaps with two heads, whose breasts and legs seem embedded in the lines and pools of black enamel. The ambiguous imagery seems to emerge from Pollock's expressive gestural marks. Once again, we see the linkage between representation and abstraction, which had interested Pollock throughout his career. The black paintings confounded critics, who initially dismissed them as aberrations. But now for some, the black paintings feel like the most natural evolution from the drip paintings. As Pollock said, I am very representational some of the time and a little all of the time. But when you are painting out of your unconscious, figures are bound to emerge. In late 1953 and 54, Pollock added some color to his paintings, but his alcoholism and his depression restricted his production. And in 1956, he stopped painting altogether. On August 11th, 1956, at 10.15 p.m., Pollock died in a single car crash in his Oldsmobile convertible while driving under the influence of alcohol. 
One of his passengers was also killed in the accident, which occurred less than a mile from Pollock's home. The other passenger, Ruth Klingman, Pollock's mistress, survived. Jackson Pollock was only 44 years old.